All right, thank you. Let's turn to Romans chapter number 16. Romans chapter number 16. I uh, plan to get through the whole chapter here in Romans chapter 16. Paul in this section uh, of Romans uh, has kind of already wound down the letter there in, verse, in chapter number 15. And in chapter number 16, um, he has a whole st- list here of friends uh, that he is addressing, that he is showing thanks for. Uh, he also so, sends out some concluding um, admonitions for us. And then, you know, make some shout outs to his people. So uh, we'll look at this tonight. But in kind of Romans, like we've been talking about this entire time, it's, it's a meticulous conversation uh, about our salvation and, um, you know, the, the different pieces of our salvation, right? The justification that we receive when uh, we put our faith in him, that when we have the grace of God in our life, that we are justified in the eyes of God. And that looks like, you know, that that we are imputed the righteousness of Christ uh, because through his death and how that, you know, we are guaranteed that salvation. And then the sanctification of going through life and, and just being empowered to look more and more like Jesus every day. And then ultimately the hope of the glorification. And in the first three chapters in Romans, Paul really addresses our need for salvation. Uh, the, the reason why we need salvation so desperately, and that is the sin in our life. And how that we, at one point prior to our salvation, prior to our justification, were slaves to that sin. And that sin needs punishment. The righteousness of God, the holiness of God demands punishment. And then the last part of chapter 3, on through chapter 5, Paul kind of talks about how that we are justified. How that we were, are justified by grace through faith. right? By the unmerited favor of God by putting our faith and trust in Jesus as our Savior. And how that that was the way of salvation in the Old Testament, how that that was the way of salvation for during Paul and during his time, and how that will always be the way of salvation, that by grace, through faith, and once again, how that we are imputed the righteousness of God, how that we are given the righteousness of God by Jesus' death on the cross And then in the next couple chapters, in in a few chapters, in chapter 6 through chapter 8, Paul really talks about our sanctification and how that um, we live our life of salvation out and how that God empowers us to pursue looking more like Jesus every day. How that that grace of God that we have in our life is the battery that pushes us down uh, the paths of righteousness, the following Christ and looking more and more like Him every day. And then in chapters 9 through 11, uh, it's a very difficult passage for some uh, to, to take uh, and it's often misconstrued, but Paul really talks about the overall sovereignty of God and how that the Jews are his chosen people and how that he fulfilled and was continuing to fulfill the promises that he had made to the Jews and to Israel Um, but that because of Israel's rejection of Jesus that the Gentiles were offered salvation because of Israel's rejection and how that while God makes choices in his divine knowledge and he gives uh, and he chose the Jews as his chosen people people, but that uh, he is still in his will, he is still, it's still his will that all would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. He wants everyone to be saved. And that's why he created us. And that's why when he created us, he created um, everyone perfect, you know, that we, that we didn't have sin in our life. Uh, so, and then um, in the last five chapters, he really deals with uh, what it looks like to be in service of God uh, in light of our justification, in light of our sanctification, in light of our glorification, the hope of our glorification, how that basically we're supposed to live righteously and how that we're supposed to coexist with uh, other people in society, uh, whether that's governmentally or relationally with non Christians and with Christians alike, and, and how that. Um, We are to live righteously in this world, in our relationships with others, with the goal of glorifying God 
and spreading the good news and telling others about him. So like I said, Paul, in, at the end of chapter 15, kind of wound down his letter. And so here in 16, we'll look at, uh, as we go through, um, some shout outs and, and some greetings to his friends. So verse, chapter number 16, verse number one, it says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sincrea, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. For she hath been a succorer of many and of myself also. So Paul starts out this list in chapter 16 of, of important people with Phoebe, who is a servant of the church. The Greek word here that is servant is also uh, the Greek word that we get our word deacon from. Um, she was an important person in the church. She was a helper within the church. Uh, many historians believe, church historians believe that, and say that she was a wealthy person uh, that helped support Paul in many of her, um, in many of his, you know, in, in all of his missionary journeys and traveling around. And that she was a person uh, that gave him money and, and supported him in that way. Uh, she also, you can kind of read from the letter or from the, this thing here, that she was probably the one that delivered the letter that Paul wrote um, from Corinth to this church in Rome. Uh, Sincrea is the port city uh, on the coast to Corinth. And so she was likely saved there in Corinth uh, through while Paul was establishing the church there. And Paul's instruction to uh, the people in Rome is to receive her uh, like godly saints should receive uh, a fellow Christian and help her in whatever ways that she needed to be helped because she was a helper to so many. So he is um, testifying to her goodness and to uh, her willingness to help him. And then in verse 3 it says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. So Priscilla and Aquila uh, are mentioned throughout the Bible. They're mentioned several times by Paul. Uh, they are also mentioned by Luke uh, in Acts. So we'll look at a couple of those. Um, but Paul identifies them as helpers uh, for him personally and helpers in the church. So in Acts chapter number 18... In verse number one, it says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his life, wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers." So Paul introduces us to Aquila and Priscilla there in Acts chapter number 18. And so he met these two in Corinth. They were Roman citizens, or they, were, they lived in Rome prior to that. They were Jews that lived in Rome. Um, but the emperor at that time had expelled all of the Jews from Rome. So they had left Rome and they had moved uh, to Corinth. And so they were there. And, and Paul had common ground with them because they also were tent makers. Uh, the, the Greek word for tent maker is also, you know, a leather craftsman. So uh, tents obviously were very popular and were very widely used. Uh, they, there was a lot of um, pilgrimage journeys and stuff. Uh, and obviously tents were used largely by uh, the Roman uh, soldiers and stuff as they traveled around. So this was a great trade to have was tent making back then. And, and Paul mentions that as a way that he uh, made money for himself to support himself as he was on missionary journeys and as he was going around. So it's good to have a trade, especially when you're a person that travels around. And so Aquila and Priscilla had this same trait. And then further down in chapter number 18, so Acts 18, 18, it says, And Paul after this tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria. And with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. 
And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So Priscilla and Aquila traveled with Paul on his missionary journeys and went, to, uh, went from town to town with Paul, helping him uh, not only uh, in his tent making and, and in raising the funds, um, but just being a part of his missionary journeys and, and teaching and preaching. Um, and and, and he, they were very faithful com- companions, uh, monetarily, prayerfully. And then a couple more verses down, you see that they were also disciples that were discipling. In verse number 26, it says, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So now the context to that verse, um, this is Apollos that they are discipling. And Paul later talks about Apollos in his letter to Corinthians, uh, to the Corinthians, when he says, you know, you all are factioned up and some of you say I am of Apollos and some of you say I am of Paul and some of you say I am of Jesus. And so Apollos had evidently gone on uh, to uh, keep preaching, um, but here Apollos did not have the full knowledge of Jesus in his life here on earth. It says that uh, he was he was you know he knew about John the Baptist and the baptism of John the Baptist. So he knew up to a certain point. And so Aquila and Priscilla, this faithful couple, uh, went, took the time out to talk to him, a, a preacher, and to help him uh, understand more thoroughly, more maturely, uh, the work of Christ. Uh, and then. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 19, it says, The churches of Asia salute you, Aquila and Priscilla salute you, much in the Lord, with the church that is in their house. So not only were they faithful journey, um, journeyers with Paul and faithful disciples with Paul, making sure that uh, everyone understood the word and continued in the word, but they also... Um, hosted a house church, and they used that uh, for meetings. And then in 2 Timothy 4.19, he tells Timothy, Salute Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onis- Onisphorus. Uh, and, and obviously Priscilla and Aquila were greatly loved by Paul. They, they are mentioned always together as well, uh, which is interesting. A, a good godly cu- couple uh, that, that made sure that they continued in the Word and continued in the preaching and teaching of the Word. Um, it, what a great example of a godly marriage and, and strong Christians who uh, had the same goal to live together and making sure that the gospel message was getting spread throughout the uttermost parts of the earth. They had that pioneering spirit. Uh, they weren't going to be tied down uh, with the cares of this world that they hopped on with Paul, went where he went, went where he went, and then also when he needed them to hang out and stay in towns for a little bit, they would stay and they would help um, to build people up. And then back to verse number 4 in Romans 16, it says, Who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. So he mentions the house that the, uh, the house church that... Um, Priscilla and Aquila had hosted at their house. Um, And and here um, we also see um, that they have an interesting story that we don't know. He says that they they, uh, laid down their own necks. So there's lots of questions that we want to ask these characters from the Bible, these people that that existed uh, thousands of years ago. And this is one of those questions. So tell me the story, Paul, of how Aquila and Priscilla risked their necks for you. Um, But don't know, the Bible does not record that one for us. Um, But he says, you know, I am very thankful for them, them risking their lives, the, the help that they are to me. And, and what a tremendous testimony that Paul is giving here. And throughout this whole chapter, uh, you know, Paul just lists all the people that are helpful to him and that are building him up in his ministry. And uh, we all know uh, that ministry is not a, a singular thing. One person uh, has very diff- a large, difficult process to go through when they're doing these things. Nothing can be done on your own. 
Uh, we need each other. This is why God created uh, community for us to live in. This is why we have uh, people around us and behind us to encourage us and to strengthen us and to, um, to be an encouragement to us. And Aquila and Priscilla obviously were that to Paul. Um, and he wanted to make sure that Everyone knew how thankful that he was for them and also uh, how that all the Gentile churches were thankful for them. So evidently they were a big blessing to everybody that knew them because they all loved them and they all loved the ministry that they were able uh, to carry out. And then he also says, salute my beloved uh, Apennitas, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. So uh, Paul is now sending his love out to the first Jesus convert in Asia who is called Eponidas. And this is, um, this is also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 16, 15. Eponidas is, or Eponidas is not mentioned. Um, but the first fruits of Achaia are mentioned. It says, I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus. That is the first fruits of Achaia. And that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. So likely Eponidas was a relative and was a part of the household of um, Stephan Stephanus. Uh, and um, they had addicted themselves to the taking care of their Christian brothers and sisters. Uh, that, that's something that uh, is, is a pretty big um, brag right there, right? That they were addicted to taking care of each other. They, that's what their goal was, was helping each other out. That they were, you know, a, a true example of that agape love that we talk about so much. Uh, that, that sacrificial love. The, the willingness uh, to forsake yourself and your own goals and the things that you have going on in your life so that you can help um, somebody else. And so, uh, once again, we see a wonderful testimony. Then in verse 6, it says, Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Once again, I have no idea what the much labor was, uh, but she was a hardworking lady. Uh, she, and, and Paul says, hey, say hey to Mary for me. Um, she's been helpful um, for me and for the church in Rome uh, that he was writing to. Once again, another good question. So what was the much labor uh, that Mary did. Maybe she made all of the slides for him. I don't know. Decorated the church or I don't know. Um, and then in verse 7 he says, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. So now Andronicus and Junia were likely a married couple given by given the example here. Uh, and, and who amongst their credentials were that they were kinsmen of his. So we don't know exactly what that means. They could have been relatives, cousins or something. Uh, but definitely they were Jews. Uh, and most likely uh, they were part of the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul identified with them as kinsmen. Uh, either way, they were saved before Paul was saved. So they were, uh, you know, doing ministry before Paul had been converted on the road to Damascus. They were well known. They were well appreciated by the other apostles. And Paul also uh, appreciated them. Uh, and they were fellow prisoners for Paul, with Paul. So they too had been imprisoned and jailed uh, for their belief in Jesus and for the preaching uh, of Jesus. Verse 8, it says, Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ. And Stachus, my beloved. Salute Apellus, approved in Christ. Salute them which are in Aristobulus' household. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. So once again, uh, Paul is just really thanking everybody for their ministry, naming people by name. Uh, and when we read this, you know, we probably... Uh, we kind of glaze over a little bit and, and try to figure out what these names mean. Now, all of these people seem to only, been men only be mentioned in uh, this part uh, of Romans and, and in this letter that Paul wrote. Um, but it's pretty awesome, 
Right? I mean, if you were in the church at Rome, and, and this is a letter that you're getting from Paul, uh, and, and he is bragging on you for who you are and for your work in the Lord, and, and, and so it's a big thing. It's an important thing for us to um, remember. I mean, this is something that you know, has been preserved for thousands of years for all of us to know their name. Uh, it's not a little thing. And then in verse 13, it says, Salute Rufus. Uh, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. So now Rufus is an interesting one. Uh, we obviously don't know for sure that this is the same Rufus, but in our, um, in our Bible study that uh, Brother Swan, uh, Dr. Swan in the school uh, did a couple weeks ago at the beginning of school, he said that he was going to use his sanctified imagination and so I really liked that, the sanctified imagination. So I'm going to use my sanctified imagination here. Turn it over to Mark chapter 15, if you want to. I, mean, I don't hear any Bibles turning, so I'm guessing you don't want to. You can listen to me, that's all right. Sandy just turned louder. <laughs> Mark chapter 15, verse number 21. And this is Jesus on his way to Golgotha. And it says, And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Now, we don't know that this is the same Rufus, um, but uh, I like to use my sanctified imagination that it could be. Uh, Mark is writing his gospel about the same time as Paul is writing this letter to the church uh, in Rome. Uh, so I think that it's a good possibility that uh, this is the same Rufus, and maybe he was well known. Alexander and Rufus uh, saw their, bro their dad go through this where he was carrying the cross for Jesus, and I imagine that that would be a big life experience, right? That would be something that you would not soon forget. Uh, so I don't really know if it's him or not, but uh, this is another Rufus that is mentioned uh, in the Bible, and so I think that it's interesting to think about once again sanctified imagination I don't don't take it as gospel but I think it's possible but either way great testimony for Rufus verse number six or sorry turn the page here um, verse number 14 salute a syncretus phlegon that one uh, that, that, that one sounds a little phlegmy I don't know Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philophagus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints that are with them. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. So all of these folks are also just mentioned here in the context of this letter. Um, but Paul, once again, is, is expressing his dedication to serving with others and appreciating them, uh, writing this letter of appreciation in a public uh, way to let others know how much he appreciates them. And he says, give them a holy kiss. All the churches that I have been to are sending their salutes and their well wishes as well. We are all in this together. This is not something that we can carry out on our own. We are not men on a hill by ourselves. We are not ladies that don't have the help of others. He said, we are all in this together. We are all accomplishing the will of God by moving forward for him, by sharing uh, this gospel message. Verse number 17, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, Contrary to the doctrine which we have learned, and avoid them. So Paul kind of gives an admonition here in the middle of all of his shout outs and all of his appreciations. And he says, all right, mark those, I entreat you, I desire strongly that you mark those who cause divisions and offenses. Look out for those people that have the 
that teach something other than what Jesus has taught us to teach. Other than these things that I have written down in this letter. Right? And he's given very ex explicit instructions on the, the things in this letter that pertain to Christ, that pertain to his sanctification, that pertain to the justification, salvation, the glorification. And he says, stay away from those. Mark those. Pay attention. Point them out. Those people that are preaching out of the will of God, saying the things that are not true. Make sure that you are be wearing of those that are causing this unity among the saints. Right? Paul spends a lot of times in Romans saying, we're all in this together. He just is calling out all these people that have been big helpers to him. And he says, but those that are causing divisions, those that are saying things that are not true, those people that are um, being stumbling blocks to younger Christians, uh, those older folks that are intentionally picking on the younger folks because they, they you know, are weaker in the faith. And, and he says, stay away from them. If the people that are causing disunity and discord, that are stirring up arguments, that have the vain babblings that he warns Timothy about. He says, stay away from all of those people that are causing the dissensions. Mark them, point them out. And avoid them. Don't be seduced by, uh, by them and their eloquent speeches and, and their interesting conversations. Stick to what God has given us, what Jesus has told us to stick to. Make the important things the important things. Pay attention. He says, For they are such serve, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. He says they aren't doing what Jesus would have for them to do. They are teaching things other than the gospel. They are teaching things that trip people up. They are taking advantage of people that um, are uh, less knowledgeable in the things of the Lord. They're taking advantage, and they're just doing it to fill their own belly. They're doing it for a job. They're not doing it out of love of Jesus and of love for each other. They're doing it because they need work. And they're doing it to try to raise money for their pet projects. And they're trying to do it for reasons other than what Jesus has put in place. So point them out. Know who they are. They're deceivers. They're taking advantage. Uh, and they're taking you down the wrong road. Stay away from those folks. Don't let them in. Don't be part of their ministries. In verse number 19 it says, For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad therefore on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. He says, Now, Beware of those people, but also I know that you guys are doing good. You guys are doing the right things. Everyone knows that you guys are doing what God would have to do. Your testimony precedes you. All of these people that I am thanking, that I'm saying hey to, that I'm showing appreciation for, uh, your, your message, your testimony has been broadcast abroad. Uh, I'm very happy about that. Paul says, you know, I, that I have joy in the fact that you are doing that which is right. But I want you to be wise in your righteousness. Be smart about staying on the path that God has put you on. You know, like we've talked about with the 23rd Psalm, that uh, he leads me in paths of righteousness. He says, be wise to following Jesus' word. Because it doesn't take much to get off that path. Right? You, you get a little bit off, and then before you know it, you're way off in right field. Paul says, make sure that you stay wise in your righteousness. Continue to steer away from evil. It's not just about doing good. It's about staying away from evil. Because evil has a way of creeping into your life. It starts as something minor. It starts as something really simple. It starts as something that you can brush off and say, eh, it's not that big a deal. But once it starts taking hold of your heart, and once you start indulging in that, it'll keep you longer. It'll take you further than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay, as Brother Qualls used to say. Uh, you, you, you just you have to avoid the evil. You have to stay away from it because it creeps into your heart and into your mind and into your soul. And, and it eats away you in a way that you just can't understand. You don't even realize until you're so far gone and you look back and you go, wow. 
have I been watching Fox News for 18 straight hours? <laughs> no one's done that, have they? I, mm-hmm. <clears throat> Paul says stay away from Stay away from that evil. Verse number 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And so here is Paul giving that last word of hope. That hope of the glorification uh, that we will once again soon soon see. Paul says, don't worry. He says, don't worry about what's going on in, in, around you. Don't worry about the circumstances of what is going on. Uh, we're going through difficult times. And it's true throughout all of eternity that we could say that. We're going through difficult times. Because Jesus said it, right, over and over. You're going to go through difficult times. Things are going to be bad. There are going to be circumstances in your life that are difficult. Paul says, don't worry. Uh, God is the the God that brings it all together, right? We talked about peace and and the idea of peace being um, a calmness, an interior, a a calmness inside of you uh, that, that comes, that only can come from having it all together. And Jesus says that the God, or Paul says that the God that pulls it all together and makes everything make sense, that God of peace is winning the fight. He's won the fight. We haven't got there yet in the timeline. But he says, don't worry. Soon Satan uh, will, will be bruised under your feet. And this is a quote from Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 15, uh, where God says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Uh, Satan made repeated attempts Uh, through Jesus' life on this earth um, to uh, trip him up, to to tempt him, uh, to cause him to sin, to thwart the plan that God had laid in place from the before there was time uh, of the redemption that Jesus brought to us. And and Satan tried unsuccessfully. But Jesus' victory will not be unsuccessful. Jesus' victory will be successful. Paul says, don't worry about any of it because soon Satan head, Satan's head is going to get bashed. It's going to all be over. He's going to be gone. He, he's not going to be a part uh, of our lives. He said, stay firm in that which you know is right and don't worry, it's all coming someday. Paul believed that Jesus was going to come back in his life. And and I've said this a few times. My dad believed it too. And eventually somebody's going to be right about it, right? He he is going to come back in somebody's lifetime. It might be ours. You never know. But Paul says, don't worry. And then he says in verse 21, Timotheus, my fellow work, my my work fellow, and Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen, salute you. I, Tertius, who wrote this apostle, salute you in the Lord. Gaius, mine host, and of the whole church saluteth you. Aristus, Aristus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you. And Cortus, a brother. So Paul sends out more well wishes. Obviously, Timothy, we know. He is Paul's uh, son in Christ. Uh, He is somebody that Paul took under his wing um, and and discipled many times. Wrote a couple letters that that, that we've looked at here uh, in the past and then he also mentions these other guys um, that are, and then Sosipater, who is a fellow Jew, maybe a closer relative. Once again, he, he identifies them as a kinsman. And then it says Tertius, who wrote this epistle. So Paul, uh, many believe, and historically Paul is known to have had you know, a vision issue. When Paul wrote things in his own hand, the, the writing was real big. Uh, So I'm guessing he didn't want to take up 50 parchments and hurt Phoebe's back carrying this letter. So Tertius actually wrote it, you know, scribed it for him. So he was Paul's scribe. Uh, And then Gaius, who was his host. The whole church at Corinth. And then Aristus, Aristus. I don't know why it's hard to say, but it is. He was a treasurer. He was a government leader. Um, and, And he goes over and he talks about all these people and how that they are sending their salutations to the church there at Rome as well. 
Uh, Like we said, Paul made no short work of spreading the gospel. He made this his life goal, and everywhere he went, there was fruit for his labor. He was telling people about Christ. He was getting people involved in the ministry. He would stick around, disciple them, help them get stronger in the faith, and then he would go to the next town. Sometimes people would travel with him, and he would leave them in next places. Sometimes they would just stay there and keep building that church. And then in verse 24, he says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Once again, grace, God's unmerited favor. I'm getting something that we do not deserve. Uh, don't forget God's grace. Paul says everything in our life is got to be focused on the grace of God and, and knowing that uh, we have God's grace. We stand in God's grace. We depend on God's grace to push us forward, to carry us, to be the, the battery that helps us do the things that he would have for us to do. Grace, always remember grace. Anything that, comes at, anything that comes at you, any problems that you're having, remember God's grace and how much He loves you and how much that He gives you favor even though you can't deserve it. There's nothing that you can do to deserve it. That He keeps on giving that to you. And then in verse 25, He says, Now to Him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, According to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So Paul writes up this letter. And he kind of puts it, you know, all in a nutshell there, for the purpose of the whole letter. He says, the good news message of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection has been clearly laid out for you all. I've given you everything that you need to know. He said, it is all here. This is a secret that was from the beginning of the world, from the beginning of time. This was something that um, the Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament people knew, knew was coming, but no one really got the whole picture of, of the work that was being done. And Paul says, but now it is made manifest. It has been brought to life. Jesus has, been, has come. He died. He was buried. He was resurrected. Uh, Rufus, you know, he, he, he saw this whole thing, you know, happen. Uh, there were many others that were alive during this time that had seen uh, Jesus go through what he went through. And Paul said that it is clearly laid out here how that you can be justified, how that you are being sanctified once you put your faith in Him, and that once you put your faith in the Lord, that you will ultimately be glorified. Paul says, share this message. All the power comes from God so that only God can get the glory. It's been laid out clearly. Tell others so that they can believe as well, so that they can be partakers in the grace of God as well. And then he wraps it up there and he says, all the glory is to be given to God by the work that Jesus did while he was here on the earth. Paul had one goal and we talk about it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And it should be our goal as well. Once again, like we talked about this morning, that God be magnified, that God be shown to the world that the love of God, the plan for, for our redemption would be shared amongst everyone that we meet in any situation that we meet and that we focus on spreading that gospel message. So, I've thoroughly enjoyed the study of Romans. So we got a couple weeks off from Sunday night, for me anyway. Uh, next week we won't have evening service and then in two weeks we'll have revival. Um, so, um, I'm going to be praying over where we move to next, right? Where we're going to spend the next year or so of our time on Sunday nights. So we'll go ahead and uh, dismiss in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that you have given to us, Lord, for the opportunity to study your word, to um, spend time looking at uh, the words that you have preserved for us 
uh, for thousands of years and so that we can um, know who you are, know um, how we can operate in, in light of the sacrifice that uh, Jesus made on the cross and, and how that we can be assured uh, that when we've put our faith and trust in Jesus as our Savior, uh, that you are working in us, that you are working with us, that you are working for us to accomplish your will here on earth, and that ultimately uh, Satan's head will be bruised and that we, the, the victory has already been won by Jesus' work on the cross. Let's pray that you'd help us to live our life in line of that and that in everything that we say and do, uh, that we would make what the world thinks is a small God big and a distant God close near in us and and a fuzzy God crystal clear so that we can uh, spread your word, spread your message, and that we would see others uh, come to uh, the knowledge of faith, Lord, and and the knowledge of who you are and and what you want to accomplish in us and with us and for us, Lord. Uh, We thank you. We love you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.